Lumpur Dung had an interesting way of explaining the Four Noble Truths. Sending the mind outside, he said, was the cause of suffering. Suffering was the result of sending the mind outside. The mind seeing the mind is the path. And the result of the mind seeing itself was the cessation of suffering. His explanation fits in with a theme that you see again and again in the teachings of the Forest of Johns, that the mind is not simply sitting there on the receiving end. It's sending things out, flowing out. Or as John Lee used to say, we go leaking out through our eyes and ears, our nose, our tongue, our body, our mind. Because we don't see the mind. We don't see what it's doing. We're focusing on other things. That's basically what craving is. The mind going out after something else and not being very aware of itself. That's why there's ignorance in the craving. Then it lands on something. But then when it lands on something, the relationship is very complex. To stay, it has to cling. In other words, it has to keep going back, back, back there. And there's going to be suffering. So it's going to be the desire, but also the irritation. They're mixed together. This is why the Buddha says to comprehend suffering. You have to abandon not only passion for it, but also your aversion and your delusion around it. That's what it means to comprehend. You understand it to the point where there's no more passion, no more aversion, no more delusion. Because you see what you're doing. You're going after things that are going to disappoint. And even if you land on them, no matter how well you land, it's always unstable. It's kind of like a cat jumping around the room from one piece of furniture to the next and suddenly finding itself on a lamp. And the lamp is wobbly. And it's got to hold on tight. And if it's not careful, if it tries to jump from the lamp to something else, it might fall. So we've got to learn how to watch the mind, to see both the craving as it shoots out for something and the clinging as it lands and tries to stay there. Remember that the word for clinging can also mean thirst. The word for craving can also mean thirst. The word for clinging can also mean to feed. So you thirst for something, you see something you don't have and you want it. And then when you get it, you hold on. And even if it's relatively stable, the fact that you have to stay tense to hold on means that there's going to be some stress and suffering. So to watch this, what do you do? Well, there are other parts of the Four Noble Truths as well. The mind seeing the mind. And the best place for the mind to see the mind is when it's in concentration. Remember the Johns when they're talking about the mind shooting out to something or flowing out to something? They're talking from the point of view of the mind in concentration. Because it's when you're in concentration that you can see that flow. Sometimes you'll see it while you're sitting, sometimes you'll see it while you're walking. The mind is going out for something and there's a physical sense of some flow. But you don't flow with it this time. You stay. That's when you have your first inkling of, oh, this is what craving is like when they're talking about the mind flowing out. This is what it's like. We ordinarily don't see this because it's flowing around all the time. It just seems to be its normal state. But when you get it really still, really quiet, 
In other words, you give it a good place to hold on to. There will be craving and clinging in the concentration itself. But for the time being, that's the path. Because that kind of craving and clinging is what allows the mind to see the mind. And you're going to deal with anything that would pull it away. The first things, of course, that pull it away are going to be sensual desire, sensual craving, and then sensual clinging. As you think about sight, sound, smells, taste, tactile sensations, there's a desire that comes up, you land on something, and then a whole state of becoming develops around that, and you're in another thought world. And if you catch yourself and can remind yourself, okay, you're not here for that. Try to develop some dispassion for it. Then you find yourself back, back at your center. And watch for the next time the mind's going to slip out. I remember when I first went to practice meditation with John Fruin, I complained to him. He said, watch for the mind when it's, going to, when it's going to go. He said, how can you see it when it's going to go? Either you're there or you're not there in the concentration, as if there was a curtain that came down around the mind. Well, this is precisely where you want to have the mind see the mind as it's preparing to go. It'll send out a little blip and then pretend like it didn't do anything. And then another one, and another one, and then it gets more and more frequent, and then finally it finally flows out. And John Cha's example is of a kettle of water. You tip it a little bit and there'll be a drop, and then another drop. And then you tip it a little bit further and then a drop, drop, drop. And then you finally get to the point where you tip it at the right angle and then the drops turn into a flow, and you're gone. You want to be able to see this. That means as you get the mind into concentration, you've got to protect it. The more ardent you are in protecting your concentration, the more likely you are to see these little blips. It's like a plant. I was talking to a botanist a couple of years back. He was talking about how there's a part of the plant that is in a state of what's called quiescence. There's not much activity going on. But it's from that quiet part of the plant that the other, plants, <clears throat> other parts of the plant will grow. And the other parts of the plant then have to protect the quiescence, because otherwise if the plant loses that quiet center, the plant loses its integrity. It can't produce all of the different parts it needs. So you've got the quiet spot, and then you've got the other parts of the plant that are active, protecting the quiet spot. That's how it is with your mind and concentration, especially in the beginning. You have to keep circling around the, the quiet center to catch any movements that might want to head out. Because if you want to see the craving, you've got to get the mind still. You have a very strong sense that this is where you want to be. And anything that would pull you away from this is something you don't want to get engaged in. You're drawing some lines. So you can see clearly when the mind oversteps the lines. And if anything starts shooting up from the mind, that's what you let go of. It may shoot, but you don't go with it. If you ride along with it, then you land on something. And that's how becoming starts, from craving to clinging to becoming.
So as I said, you draw the line. The state of concentration is what you want, and you have to develop a sense of dispassion, disinterest in any of the other becomings the mind could develop right now. This is one of the reasons why John Lee, when he gives concentration instructions, especially in his early books, has long explanations about first developing a sense of sangwega to anything outside of where you are right here, right now. A strong sense that any other topic that would come up in the meditation is a place where you just don't want to go. You've seen through it. Now the seeing through it may be not all that deep, but at least it's enough to remind you it's out of bounds. Remember the image of the quail or the image of the monkeys. The quail stays in its field, it's safe. If it leaves the field, the hawk can get it. That's the Buddha's image for mindfulness, but it's also his image for concentration, because after all, the two go together. We're sometimes told that mindfulness is wide and accepting whatever comes up in the mind, you're just mindful of it. But the Buddha says, no. When you're really mindful, you stay in your territory. You start wandering out into nice sight, sound, smells, taste, tactile sensations. You're outside of your territory. You're in a dangerous land. So you have a strong sense of what's safe and what's not safe. The same with the monkeys. In the area where monkeys go but human beings don't go, that's where you want to stay. The place where human beings and monkeys can go, that's where they lay traps for the monkeys. Again, sights, sounds, smells, tastes, tactile sensations that are really nice and really interesting. That's outside of your territory. When you have a strong sense of the territory, that's how you get secluded from sensuality, secluded from unskillful states, and how you get the mind into concentration. And then as the mind settles in, you get a clearer and clearer sense of when it's beginning to move out. So if you really want to see these things, if you want to have the mind see the mind, you've got to get it still, right here. Because after all, when the Buddha gained his insight into the Four Noble Truths, where was he? He was in the fourth jhana. And if you want to get a good sense of what he means by his various terms, well, you try to get your mind there, too. But you want to sit where he sat, be where he was. And then as the mind begins to flow out, you can see, oh, this is what the Buddha says is the cause of suffering, and this is what has to be abandoned. And you abandon it by not going with it. It'll go out for a little ways, and if you don't ride with it, then it loses its momentum. And you've begun to gain some insight into what the Buddha was talking about, where the craving is, where the clinging is. And you get a better and better sense of what your duties are and where you do them. Because once your duties are clear, then you've cleared up a lot of confusion right there. 